Sure, go for it. Excellent. I've got Ben here, and we're just about to discuss media performance with and transhumanism, especially with regard to some of the recent uh, um, news about longevity being, or the anti-aging being uh, sort of an initiative put forward by Google. Ben, what are your thoughts on this Sputnik style moment? Is it a Sputnik moment or is it just something that will pass and people forget about in two months? I think that society is gradually waking up to the idea that aging is not necessarily inevitable and you know it's not preordained that we have to die after 70 80 90 years or, or whatever as we more fully understand human biology and just gain a broader understanding of the fact that the human body is basically just another physical system and yeah it may wear down as it gets old like an old car does but it can it can be repaired and the problems can be fixed and society is gradually waking up to this idea year by year and the, the recent announcement by Google that they're putting some energy and, and some funding into longevity research I mean this this is, is, is part of a trend that's been picking up steam for a while and I'm, I'm happy to see Google jumping on board. It certainly um, will say something to a lot of people who don't know anything about longevity research in other areas but who know Google um, and you know for Google to come out and say something like they have might mean something to people uh, a lot more than you know somebody who they don't know who's saying something about longevity. I, I, absolutely, I think the the indirect value of Google jumping into this space may be just as important, perhaps ultimately more important than the direct research value. I mean, I I hope that Google's funding directly leads to a pill that I can take to extend my life by thirty years beyond what it would otherwise be, but even if Google-funded scientists are not the ones to make the breakthrough, the mere fact that Google is backing up longevity research, this may make others take it seriously all around the world, and then who knows which funding source or which researcher will ultimately make the breakthrough, but what's what's important is that around the world the idea that longevity far beyond what we know now is achievable this idea is is picking up steam and it's it's no longer just the province of a few visionaries you know howling out in in the wilderness it's, it's something that makes and, and government seriously and that, that that's a one thing yeah, it certainly is. Um, Aubrey de Grey had something to say. He was uh, interviewed and it made into a Time uh, article and he said the beginning of the beginning of war on ageing that began in the 1990s, that is sort of ended now and since then the battle for the hearts and minds as to the quest feasibility has been progressing at full tilt. And so in a sense now he thinks that his job has gotten a lot easier since it you know, a big player like Google um, has come out and said, yes, we're going to fund this sort of thing as well. So, I mean, like, it's, it does seem like the... We've got the permission in public to say that we want to research anti-aging without being ridiculed as much. That's right. I, I, I wouldn't say that the war for the public mind has been won by yeah. any means. Probably the majority of Americans would still say, you know, death is natural and inevitable. That's just the order of things. But e even so, I think it is true that now, as opposed to, say, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, now you can seriously say you're a scientist working toward the radical extension of human lifespan and people will taken in stride as a valid scientific pursuit, whereas, you know, a couple of decades ago, to a significant extent, even 10 years ago, 
if you admitted in polite company that you were working on human immortality, people would think you're you're a Raelian. and there's some some kind of complete lunatic. So it's it's definitely becoming more mainstream to be seriously thinking about I'm working on radical longevity and that that's a good thing. Then as Aubrey has pointed out, that means that more attention can be focused on the more interesting question of how to do it rather than having to waste so much energy arguing on whether it makes sense at all to extend life radically. Now more of the dialogue can be focused from does it make sense at all to talk about radical lifespan extension to what's the best way to achieve radical lifespan extension? Is it is it putting band-aid in effect on hundreds of things going wrong around the body? Is it trying to understand some fundamental metabolic or genomic problem that, that causes causes aging to happen? Is it is it taking an approach like the, the late Robert Bradbury advocated and doing robobiotics, putting little nanobots in, inside the body to repair the problems that occur? There's a lot of possible approaches and my hope is that as Google, various governments and companies get to the game of radical longevity that a broad variety of creative approaches is, is explored. What we saw with nanotech, for example, was that when nanotech made the transition from the, the wild-eyed prognostications of Eric Drexler and other nanotech pioneers to being a mainstream scientific pursuit with more government and corporate funding, you saw somewhat a narrowing of the scope of what, what nanotech is, is construed to be. There's amazing nanotech research going on, of course, but many of the interesting visions Drexler and other early nanotech pioneers had still are, are sort of backburnered. Where are the molecular assemblers, right? And one hopes that with longevity research, you don't see that sort of thing happen where, yes, the field becomes more popular, but it also becomes channeled on a certain narrow set of interesting but not maximally exciting approaches. I, I really hope that the creativity that we see in the longevity research community now, that that creativity is maintained as the level of interest and in funding in the area in increases. Because, I mean, there's really nothing that is more critical and more important to human beings than not dying, right? This is, this is about as important and exciting a research area as, as there is. Definitely. And you've had quite a bit to do with uh, longevity research yourself with Genesiant and um, doing yeah. machine learning over a whole data set of like uh, output from Chinese medicine, for instance. Yeah, so far I have 46 years of experience in not dying and I hope, hope, uh, hope to continue that. And I've been involved in longevity and age-associated disease research in, in, in various ways for about 10 years now, actually, and I, I've seen the, the challenges that exist. I mean, we, we understand more and more about why aging happens each year, but it, it's a very large and complex problem, and I, I don't personally think there's not going to be one pharmacological or biological silver bullet to cure aging. I mean, it, if there was going to be one silver bullet, it would be like an intelligent nanobot that could go in and figure out what to fix or, or a mind uploading type solution. But to the extent there's going to be a pharmacological or biological solution to the aging problem, it's going to be a complex and multifaceted solution maybe involving some fundamental repairs to the metabolic cycle inside every cell and also a host of repairs to different body systems that are breaking down. It's, it's going to be a lot of different solutions because aging is, is a lot of different problems and that's going to take a lot of different researchers. So I think if, 
if there is going to be a sort of biological, pharmacological, gene therapy, stem cell, wet type solution, quite possibly Google's enterprise will solve some parts of it. You know, the Beijing Genomics Institute will solve other parts and who knows, some some 13-year-old in his garage in Kazakhstan may, may solve another part. I, I don't know, but it's it's large and multifaceted. In terms of my own work, what I've worked on is the application of AI to studying genomic, proteomic, and other data relative to long-lived organisms. And my hope is that that can be part of the picture as well. I mean, one vision I've had for a while, just get all the data regarding aging into one large knowledge graph and set the AI to work, understanding what's going on and then proposing new experiments. And, you know, perhaps speculating freely, Google could help with that aspect since they're very good at knowledge graphs and at, you know, centralizing, organizing, and, and, and searching data. So that, that will be one interesting hypothetical direction for the future. Could, could Google get involved in the interfacing of the, the wet lab work, which certainly is critical to finding a biological solution to the aging problem, with the informatics side of things, where AI is critical, but also just structuring and gathering together the multitudinous types of, of, of data relevant to longevity is important. So I think there, there's a lot of potential there in Google or IBM or other large IT companies getting involved. Just computing AI all these things potentially have a large role to play a alongside the more obvious wet lab aspect. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see a big future for machine learning to, um, up, I guess, learn from huge data sets and be able to tell us things that are just ridiculously hard for the human eye to recognize. Um, in what areas do you think might be um, easily harvested. What what uh, what sort of data sets do we have now that we could apply machine learning algorithms to get more information or more insights from that we haven't done so far? Well, there's a huge amount of data related to age-associated disease and longevity online right now. I mean, from many different organisms, from human beings with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, heart disease, all sorts of age-associated diseases, and then data on the genomics of long-lived humans, and then, you know, mouse studies, rat studies, fly studies, such as I've worked on with Genetion. There's genomic data, there's proteomic data, metabolomic data. I mean, I'm not sure you can put your finger on any one particular data set or type of data or even one particular organism whose data is is critical. There may be, but we don't know that until we've done a lot more research. To me, the important thing is to take all this data and commonly normalize it, import it into a huge knowledge graph, and then let a variety of researchers go at it with a variety of different AI methodologies. And right now, that's tedious to do on a practical basis just because the data is so heterogeneous and with each new data set you want to look at you have to read the paper especially with the data set figure out how to normalize the data how to interpret the rows and columns and the spreadsheets and so forth so I, I think some degree of work on building these cross-organism cross-experimental data type knowledge base for longevity research yeah, would, would certainly and I, I think ultimately I mean just like Google did with, with Google Scholar say they took scientific research papers I mean if, if you had a Google bio data right that, that would be something and whether Google does that or it's ultimately the US National Health or IBM or some other non-profit I don't eventually 
something like that will emerge rather than the kind of valuable yet low tech and very messily structured knowledge repository that the National Institute of Health now maintains. Yeah, definitely. Once you get something like that, that's that's certainly gonna gonna help. But I mean that's that's only one possible direction and there there's a lot of different directions that can add value in terms of understanding longevity, AI and data integration being being one of them. And my hope is the world can progress on that on on many fronts at, at one time. I mean the the amount of work we put into cancer research as a society is dramatic, yet most people don't get cancer. On the other hand, if we don't do something dramatic about it, we're all gonna die. Right? So that I'm, disease unless you consider life itself a disease so I mean <laughs> we should be putting a lot more attention into this I mean I know when when I was like three years old and some relative of mine died I first realized you mean all these people my parents me my friends were all going to be dead and no one cares, right? We all just kind of accept this. Come on, this is this is an emergency. We should be doing something here, right? And I mean, the human race isn't quite to that level yet, but at least that attitude is getting is getting a foot in the door, right? You're you're allowed to think that way now, and you you won't you won't get laughed out of the university. And I, I think that's that's a big step forward. And G Google stepping into the longevity arena is indicative of the progress we're making both scientifically and in terms of, of attitude adjustment. <laughs> Definitely, I like that.